Intersectionality is a sociological school of thought that actually came out in the 60s with the feminism movement. So it was largely um, women of color who rejected the idea that there was a one-size-fits-all idea for feminism, that every woman had the exact same um, struggles in life, whether they were a black woman, an Asian woman, or so on. So it was a, um, a school of thought that said, we can't just treat everyone as a big lump sum. We have yeah, to see what individual circumstances apply to each person. And since the 60s, it's gone beyond just feminism okay. to uh, minority movement so. equality in general. So um, that's where we come into the topic of this, which is um, how this actually has an intersection with uh, the video game movement Sorry, the video game uh, representation. So, um, so some. Uh, I guess I'll start off with uh, some figures. Everyone likes statistics. So, um, the ESA just recently did a study. Uh, so, 47% of American gamers are actually female, which is actually interesting because in the UK that's not quite the case. The majority of them are male. So, 47% of American gamers are female. 46% uh, percent of women are the primary purchasers of video games. 38% of people who own an Xbox are female, and oh, no, people no, say 50% of their users are female. Uh, and despite what uh, you may think about what actual women are buying, 40% of, sorry, 20 percent of women play Call of Duty, and 15% play Grand Theft Auto, so it's not all farm level. So um, this is a big, 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 big jump from where we were in 1989, where only 3% of women were gaming their graphics. So it begs the question of where is all the representation for people of color, for disabled gamers, and so on and so forth. And that's the uh, topic that I think we'd like to discuss in this <laughs> Oh yeah, I could do that too. So, um, I just like to talk. Uh, my name is Joshua Meadows, and I'm a writer. I used to write for Gay Gamer, uh, I used to write for XY, Magazine, News, for that um, I've done stuff with Kotaku, Joystick, and so on. Uh, I live in Sydney now where I help run Sydney Gamers, which is a um, local LGBT group for uh, you know people who like video games. And I'm Maddie Rice. Um, I write uh, media criticism for Games and Play, um, and I also develop games. Um, and do some kind of grassroots organization and activist work in games and I'm um, hoping to do some more community. I also do consulting for companies um, and indies. Um, and so this topic is really close to my heart with that. Um, and unfortunately we're missing um, Jen Frank, but um, the whole thing she'll call her. Yeah. <laughs> but um, either way, you should check out her work as well. She's also um, a media critic who writes a lot of great long videos on games and they're all going to make you cry. So if you like crying, um, look up. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'm hoping she can wander in at some point. We're not entirely sure of where she is, but I did have um, several quotes of articles of hers that we'll still bring up anyway, so <laughs> whether or not she's here. So, um, so yeah, so we were talking about um, the lack of actual representation, despite the fact that, in particular, women make up such a huge per purchasing demographic. So, um, the the uh, I guess I want to start off with what the impact this lack of representation has. I think you know most people here can probably understand at a high level what that means. Where if you're playing a video game and you don't see anyone that actually looks like you, how that makes you feel having to put your shoes in the feet of someone else that isn't related to you directly. So um, I can you know approach this from the perspective of the game, but um, you know that's the I think the guys get a lot of voice on this subject already anyway. So as a um, you know a transgender woman of color when you play a video game and you know what is the the initial impact when there's something there that doesn't really speak to you as a person and your experience well um for me it, it, I, I guess what was interesting is you know i never really thought about it for a really long time you know i just like video games and you know, I usually played like JRPGs, which are like, you know, like there was one black person, and I think you know, think who that is. 
Um, and, um, you know, I didn't really quite, it didn't hit my like 10 to 21 year old mind that mm, there aren't a lot of people of color, there aren't a lot of gay people, you know, it just didn't come up. Um, but I played them and I really loved them and enjoyed them. I think of them a little bit differently now, but it's now when I sound like, you know, I feel like I keep seeing the same people over and over again. You're like, things are just boring, I guess. You know, like, well, we're going to have, you know, this dude who's obviously, you know, like, doesn't have good emotional intelligence trying to, uh, you know, proposition this girl who really doesn't know what she's doing here, you know, and it just, it's just the same thing over and over again. I just, in my own personal relationships, I have lots of friends of lots of different identities, and they're super interesting people, and I would just like to see them and their quirkiness, you know, go on. And, and even just different dynamics, you know, you can kind of just tell that, like, you know, developers are really interested in making a great game, and then the writing comes, um, and <laughs> and they um, are like, well, what works? What have we seen before? Or whatever. And I'm just like, plug it right in, right? And I don't really think anybody ever, you know, maliciously doesn't put in certain people. But for me, what was really interesting, you know, on the counterpoint is that when I made my game, my Nietzsche, it was about um, myself. I tried to make myself a character, and I got super emotional. I got like really, it was the weirdest thing. I made like the pixel, you know, uh, sprite sheet of myself. And it was just, I, I, I got emotional about it. And it, it wasn't until I, then that I realized how much I just don't see anyone like myself. You know, I just can't think of too many, you know, badass women with afros. I mean, it just, it should be. Like, that's such an easy thing, if you ask me. <laughs> so, it's just like, I, 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 it, it, it became a thing for me, in a weird way, um, I just want to play as other people. I want the chance to, you know, look at other people's lives. I want the chance to, you know, have different people in different situations and mutual stuff. So I think it's more out of like a boredom more than it is like a pride for item at this point. Yeah. I, I, yeah, the, uh, I think the boredom aspect of it is a really good point too because the, the white guy, the white big jock muscle man, I think that's been done to death. Uh, it's uh, funny though that I had written down what you were talking about, about the one black guy, like the Squeenix games. Like even Final Fantasy VII, you may think that of that as like a stereotype, like Barrett with his big afro. But like even Final Fantasy XIII, which came out just a couple years ago, has Saz, who is it, Barrett, but with, you know, Chris Rock's accent instead. <laughs> um, so, so, so we do have, you know, examples of games that are still trying to actually be a little bit more diverse and how that misses the mark and sometimes you know, does a good job, sometimes doesn't do a really good job. From the gay angle, uh, I think, I'm sure I'm going to get some groans, but Kodo from Enchanted Arms, does anyone know who that is? So it's this really, really terrible character. <laughs> really, really terrible character. And he is a good example of um, a, a pervasive stereotype, I think, when game developers who try to shove someone in who's the diverse of, like, he starts out and he is predatory, uh, effeminate, homosexual, like, the sort of thing that Westboro Baptist Church says this is what all gay people are like. So he's very flamboyant, very effeminate, hits on the main character perpetually despite being told no. And then, ha like, fairly early on in the game, he disappears, and halfway through, um, after a really secretive, like, badass character with a deep voice and surly accent comes out. Um, he's revealed to be Makoto, who had, like, some sort of life epiphany or something. And stopped being gay. And the whole point is that he stopped being really gay, and now he's a really cool character. And, like, the message that that sends to people who, you know, as a gay person playing that, the, the lispy, effeminate character is clearly supposed to be seen as a negative. And then he goes away and he's shrek now. And, and he's much better for it. So, the, like, there's examples of developers who try, and I don't even know if that was necessarily trying to include a gay character or what, but that's definitely an example, I think, of what not to do. And, um, like, by the way, we've got David Gator who's here, and I'm sure he will talk about this in his own panels, but the, the new character coming out in Inquisition, which was the first fully gay character that um, he said he's written, and how this is, um, this is something that I personally like to see more of, that whether or not you, you got past Bioware games where they have um, characters who are gay, but 
it doesn't really come up until you like pursue it. Whereas this character, he's out and very much proud about it. And I would like to see you know that more because sure we get the straight stuff constantly, but you you the the, the examples that you, we get of diversity in games tend to be um, optional. So you opt into the the gay content, you opt into you know the other stuff, whereas you can't opt out of the straight stuff. So it would be nice to see you know that in counterpoint as well. Um, so the sorry, going through my notes. <laughs> so the um, so representation wise, uh, the sorry, I have a very I should have done this more organized. <laughs> Huge list of notes and not not collated correctly. Um, so the uh, so so what is Okay, so I wanted to get into, we have um, the, the characters that you have in games and then the attempts at diversity. And so what is the, um, you know, the impact of groups that are excluded from this when you focus on the, the straight male gaze type thing and what this is to you know, people who don't fit into that paradigm, the customer who's still buying the game anyway. And you know, what, like for me growing up, I didn't, this was, you know, 60,000 years ago. We didn't have, you know, you barely had any character who wasn't a white guy at all. Like, the original Mario was just a pixel. So um, the the impact for me growing up as a gay guy and not seeing any of this was, I felt very, I've said this before, that I felt like there was a more weirdness directed towards me being a gamer than someone who played, or sorry, than someone who was gay. But I felt like I was more outside on that basis than the fact of sexuality, because it just felt like, it felt like I wasn't, um, you know, this was something that was not catered to me. I was clearly not the customer that the developers were going after, and I was clearly not the sort of person that they were interested in engaging. So I felt like an outsider on that point. Um, I think more often when I think about advocacy is how much I think about the people who are coming after me more than I think about myself at this point. Because I know like I've already experienced, I think many people here do too, like, you know, we lived our teenage years. You know, um, those are over. Sad. You know? <laughs> I watch anime for them now. Um, <laughs> and I think that, you know, I can't save myself from growing up without, you know, media figures for myself. Um, I can't, you know, the, the representation of people, you know, really, really matters when you're growing up and you feel alone and there's no one there to kind of give you like a, hey, you're cool, you know, kind of thing. Um, so I think about now um, about the people who do see characters now, who are, who are going to, you know, maybe like some, I don't know, Bioware games, what they're rated, but they're probably like 13 playing them. Uh, you know, knowing that and seeing that there's, you know, a possibly diverse group of people there. I mean, I don't remember how many aliens I could romance when I was 13 either, but like, <laughs> I think. At least four or five. <laughs> <laughs> um, at least it's just this idea that, that different people are getting together and the idea that you can. Um, you know, multiple people with different backgrounds can be the same thing. It's just going to be a natural thing to a lot of people. Like, I mean, if anybody is in education right now, especially in high schools, like, you will see how different, like, they think and see when it comes to diversity and things like that. Like, it's a given to a lot of people. Like, yeah. of course we want this. Like, what are you talking about? It's ridiculous. Um, so I think um, right now when it comes to, like, the effects of things, um, right now, I think we can maybe, uh, you know, as enthusiasts, probably have a sense of like missing nostalgia. To be quite honest, you know, the idea of like, you know, here's the things that we could have. Yeah. I, think, I think I think right now it is about saying that people are after us. And then, you know, as a side note, on the on the smaller scale of things, because I don't think we only have to talk about large games and large publishers. Um, a lot of the smaller games that are out there are very, you know, autobiographical and cathartic and emotional. They, and you can really connect with them. Um, and thankfully, though, those are a lot more common now. Um, I, thankfully, we don't have to wait for larger games and publishers to be talking about our experiences. So, 
Yeah, I think I think there is a little bit of a mix of agendas there. Because, you know, I mean, people in our age group. Well, you certainly have a lot of experience with the 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 indie side of it, mm -hmm. doing games that you know approach a, a specific message on your part. I know that it's been you know something that you've gotten a lot of. Even mainstream notice the first time um, I encountered your game was actually in the, the piece that Polygon did on oh, yeah. indie game developers in the queer scene, mm -hmm. and um, and you're right that the as indie developers it's something that you know you can pick up the slack for that the bigger game companies aren't actually catering to, and I know you've been a big advocate of diversifying. Um, the tool sets that people can use and you know making that more democratic so and more accessible as well. Yeah, I mean and kind of like to um, some of my thoughts when it comes to intersectionality, especially when it comes to these companies that right now we're kind of seeing a pecking order, right? We're seeing like, okay, we're gonna get women done. You know, we'll get their polygons into the game. And then, <laughs> and we'll, but it takes, you know, they have to completely double the budget. <laughs> Apparently, create options for people. You know, the options to be gay, I guess, or whatever else is now a thing. Um, and then, you know, and then I guess once that's done, then we can consider making the polygons a shade darker. Um, you know, and then, and then, and then but you notice a pecking order in the conversations. So you can, you obviously hear like you know, uh, you know, uh, topics about disability, like, what? Yeah. you know, like no one talks about that in the mainstream. Uh, about um, about classism, about uh, the crisis, and and um, the kind of equipment people need. Like we're in a new console generation. I can tell you, I can't afford a, a console right now or ever again, probably. Um, so I, I, I kind of think about how we consider the, the things that the technology and the prices, um, and then and then those topics. Because I can imagine we all play games where. You know, class is not really done very, not very well. Um, so I think it's um, what's most interesting to me about um, people making their own games is that they're not thinking of themselves like, okay, I am, you know, gay, white, from Europe. Okay, and then they're not like ticking off every single one. Like, okay, I need a gay part of my game. I need like a five-six part of my game. I need a, you know, whatever. Um, so I think what's most interesting is that you get to see this kind of like blurry, you know, mess of qualities, you know, together and not have it be this kind of like agenda thing of like, you know, we have, you know, you know, two out of, you know, ten of our characters are really yay, you know, like yeah. it doesn't have to be so stratified that way. So Yeah, uh, yeah, I you de I, I like the um the word usage of pecking order there because it's mm -hmm. definitely you can see on the there's some ad executive who's like, okay, our game has one gay character, so we'll get at least you know four <laughs> articles about this. Right. And 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 the pecking order has uh, it's a nice segue into I guess what I'd like the broader conversation of this to be that the idea of as it was in the '60s with intersectionality for feminism that there's a place for it here too, and it's it may seem silly to put video games in the context of the civil rights movement, but I think that there's a lot of, um, um, you know, parallels here between, like you mentioned Lost in a Soldier earlier, and I, I, I do wonder what it must be like for kids who are growing up today who, you know, have role models like Ellen and Anderson Cooper that, you know, I certainly didn't have when I was a kid. And you have this access to, you know, far more diversity in video games than I think we've ever had before. And not only that, but people in the actual gaming community themselves are a little bit more interested in policing, you know, the negative behavior of the community in a way that I've never seen before. As certainly, both as someone who played video games and someone who, you know, worked on, you know, the other side of it as a critic and so on. And, and there's far more people who are willing to stand up and say, you know, you can't say things like that to people. And um, on the one hand, like, it's really awesome to see that. And then on the other, I think that a lot of people, especially really young kids these days, are growing up where this is 
expected. And, and that's awesome that it's expected, but you can get, I guess, desensitized to what the struggle actually was previous. Mm -hmm. So that's where um, the, the pecking order, I think, is a really important thing to keep in mind because it's awesome to have gay characters in video games or you know, in movies, in books, in music, and so on. But then if it's always the same gay character who's, you know, a white, relatively attractive Twinkie Blonde, um, <laughs> then you've only replaced one set of, you know, catering with a different one. And I think as, uh, as you know, someone in the LGBT community, we all have to be more cognizant of where we fall into that type of order. And especially straight white, uh, sorry, gay white dudes. I forgot what I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a gay white dude, that's something that I try to be really, really, really aware of. That um, you, you know, there's there's experiences that I don't have because I, you know, am white and I grew up in a middle class um, upbringing. And there's there's things that I can't directly relate to, but you can draw parallels to from your own struggles and your own experiences. And you know, one of, the, one of the things that's really important to me is making sure that we don't stop that there's a gay guy in our video game, so we're done. That, or, you know, there's a, there's a white woman in our video game, so we're done. So it's, that's something that's really important to me. It's something that I think, that I think it's our responsibility to push developers that, you know, it's cool to get the gay characters in and we appreciate that, but you have to keep going. It's not gold mission accomplished. <laughs> but, um, so, um, I, so on that topic, I wanted to move into the idea of um, our responsibility, both as you know, people in presumably, if you're here, you're interested in activism, or you have you know some some you know awareness of that. Is that Jen? It's Jen. Hi. <laughs> Treat me differently 
Um, and that's not that's not even mad, bad. I'm not even mad, bro. But like, <laughs> but it's definitely changed my perspective on life. So it's it's not even that good or that bad. It's just it's just how my worldview changed, and I I hope very healthfully, healthily, um, just sort of like readjusted my lens uh, given this new information, and that's how it affected my worldview. And so, and I also um, navel gaze a lot. <laughs> so, so anyway, I like to uh, how I used to be an essay by Jen. Fra you know, and I, I get to, I get to write that. Because, <laughs> so, uh, and Maddie said earlier that you do the long form, and as someone who um, is constantly told TLDR. I, I can relate to that. <laughs> Sorry, you have to cut that down. Like they made me use 150 characters to describe this battle. And that was one of the most challenging things I've done. <laughs> Only 150 punctuation counts too. <laughs> yeah, it, intersectionality is like 40. But <laughs> On the subject of um, replacing one one section of you know a demographic that's catered to with another, I think that a lot of people are aware now that there's sexism in the video game industry. Is there anyone aware that's the case? You know what? Though, actually, I'm glad um, people noticed that. No, that's the thing. I'm glad you noticed. But seriously, though, because in 2006, somebody approached me at E3. It might have been 2005. I think it was 2006. Somebody approached me at E3 and asked me if I were willing to talk on a camera for what it was like being a woman in the industry. And I was like, no. <laughs> no, I'm not willing to discuss that on a camera for you. What is wrong with you? I just got here, so I'm trying to ruin it. <laughs> so um, it's something that people were very frightened um, to discuss for a really long time. And we definitely swept that under the rug because it was just like, do, do you not like having a job? <laughs> Are you not grateful to all of the very good men? And that, and, 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 and by and large, that's your very good men who let you have this job. Yeah, I have a more specific <laughs> grateful to be here? Why would you go on a camera and just get right? So I'm glad that people do notice, uh, notice that now because, what is that, eight years ago? Eight years ago? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll go back to my statistics. Um, the IGDA uh, women are, as according to 2013, they're 22% of game developers in the industry um, versus 2009 where they were only 11.5%. So I think all the good men who deign to give you a job is actually a really good point. But um, I should also say that none of those stats include all of us in this room who are creators, right? We're all making games. We're all doing things. I don't know, are we? I mean, I've made a game, I've never blown a survey. So yeah. I like to kind of think that, you know, I would just like to think that there's a lot more that, that is going on. Uh, that Because I, I know a lot of people are really attached to um, us having numbers, if you will. You know, like, get those numbers. Let's, let's hit 20%. I'm like, no, let's, I don't know. I don't want to get 20%. You know, I don't yeah. you know, I have this. Don't let that be words. Right. And so it's just kind of interesting to me because, I, you know, part of our conversation, I find it really hard to talk about diversity in games if we can only talk about one subject at a time. Like, can we only talk about, like, women? And this is the thing that is interesting because I mean, Twitter has been coming up in this conversation, but it's actually very important to talk about because a lot of our activism happens there now. Um, and just how much, like, this one item list, like, you know, doesn't allow people to express themselves. Like, I just think about a lot of the, a lot of people who are of faith and can't really talk about it because they have some other, you know, topic that they or people who are, you know, have a disability, but because like sexuality is more important right now, they need to talk about that. And it's just really, it just would have, we would have such an easier time, to be quite honest. Like, we would have such an easier time if we were all allowed to not have to pitch ourselves, if you will, elevate our pitch ourselves of like 150 characters. Um, like, you know, in a tweet, which I feel like people want, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, the, and that's, I guess, really the whole salient point of the, you know, the panel here, that the, you can't approach these issues on, you know, a one item 
checkbox, like we've, yeah. we've dealt with this, so let's move down to the next line item. Mm -hmm. It's not a board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I, I absolutely agree that the, 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 the whole the whole idea of intersectionality as a political movement came out um, because you know people did not feel that their needs were being addressed by the mainstream and like even in the the LGBT movement right now, may, gay marriage is the thing that is the thing. And if you are not someone who really is particularly concerned with that, you don't have anything else. There's the conversation about you know homeless youth. Where is that? Like you know even though they. They make up the majority of actually, you know, the homeless population under 30, and then transgender people are, you know, even a substantially larger block of the homeless youth in there. And, um, you know, there are things that I you know, personally think should be addressed a little bit ahead of gay marriage, but that's the topic du jour. And um, so that's the idea of where intersectionality came from that people did not feel like, you know, their needs were being met or discussed. And, and that's you know half the challenge sometimes just actually getting to the table to have a conversation about it, and you know, with um, right <clears throat> from a perspective like feminism, um, from that vantage, it's exactly the same thing. Feminism isn't meeting anybody but white ladies, straight white ladies, mm -hmm. and so we need more out of feminism too, which is why I think it's important to take. The, the intersectional angle with, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and the... Uh, piping up. <laughs> what, what feminism should do. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and what you were saying about Twitter being where uh, activism is, that was actually a huge discussion pretty recently, too, about how um, mainstream feminism wasn't, you know, dealing with the needs of people of color. Um, and so, so uh, I think we can rattle on and on and on politics, but the, I think since you're here for a video game convention, you want to know what this has to do with video games. So um, the, I guess the, the, the understanding what the issue is and where we can't stop with, um, you know, just addressing the needs of white gay guys any more than white characters in, you know, in general, the, um, uh, what is, I guess, the, where does it go from there? So if we understand that one checkbox can't be where the conversation ends. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to put this, like, uh, basically in a way of um, being super aware of um, how we gather around labels and causes. Um, because I think very often we gather uh, in ways that give to who is the most popular minority right now at the moment, right? So, you know, we have a lot of things that people are doing, well, let's do women in games things. Um, especially in San Francisco, there's a lot of like, yeah, let's get women doing things. Unfortunately, um, the, the, these resources are only available to like women who already have jobs, women who tend to be white or East Asian, uh, that tend to be you know in a certain socioeconomic place, um, and I think oh, I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. What did I just? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was just thinking. I was just going on. What was your question? I'm sorry. I don't know what my question was. <laughs> I was. What was it? You asked. Yeah. So where do we go from? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes. So and what happened is. <laughs> Because if we, it, it's kind of like, if we only do, let's just do things for women in games. Like, women have a whole bunch of other issues besides, like, you concerned with what their body looks like and what their body is doing when they're typing on a computer or what their body is doing, you know, elsewhere. Um, there's a whole bunch of other factors that come in. So once that, that mother is not white and has a family and has a whole bunch of other things, that that, like, changes a whole bunch of factors of how to actually solve the problem, right? If you're just assuming that this is like the, you know, the, you know women, you're thinking about the women who need the least amount of help is the one that we're going to, you know, campaign around. So that's kind of like how, how I think we're not solving our issues very intelligently. And also, I think it also puts up certain people above the rest. So I think a lot of people in, who are activists right now are tokenized. And they're being like, ah, oh, here's this wonderful saint 
you know, person or, you know, martyr or devil, which very often happens, and they're put on to be the example of all minority, you know, minority yeah. people, right? And in that same way, it really doesn't, one, doesn't give enough credence to that person who they are as an individual, and two, it just kind of seems like you all are all the same. So I can just throw money at you in this very particular way and your problems will be solved. You know, um, and it, and that's just not going to be. You know, that's not going to work. You know, what works for me is grassroots organizations. Is talking with individuals, people. That I would say like, okay, Jen, you and I, we have this like, connection or whatever. We have this understanding. Let us go together to solve our issues. Thank you. Um, I have the PR people to remember things. Um, and and so it, 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 and because it matters to us as individuals and how our lives work, it's going to work better. Instead of like Jen, I'm like, okay, what is the state of living? You know, <laughs> and for and for us, it'd be like, oh well, all women, uh, you know, write uh, about games on Twitter and, uh, and complain about pizza toppings. You know, like that's all that's all in. So I think that if we if we um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of true, you know. But I, I think if if we all kind of took a very individualistic sense of like, what is what are the people on a on a ground level? Happening, then we can actually, you know, publish this. Do you want to jump in there? Mm. Oh, I was, I was enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes. Thank you. Yes, I, I agree. I, um, <laughs> do you think it's like time for questions? Yeah. Yeah. Can we do that? I, I don't know the question off the. No, she seems fine. Yeah. No, I, right, I think that's just questions. Yeah. I think you had your head up first. Um. So. Uh, Going uh, specifically in the gaming and development sphere, as someone who comes from pretty much the apex of intersectional privilege, uh, what would your advice be for for uh, doing uh, like tackling these intersectional intersectional issues of of class of uh, the differently able of gender of um, of uh, trans issues, like, like how while working on a team, uh, because I think the no, answer is uh, not so much <laughs> while working on a team. No, okay. More like while working on on individual personal projects or like small teams where I where I'm the creative and other people are just like contracted working for me. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm currently wrestling with how to do this without being that guy who is who is uh, who is the man who is sexism's answer. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, I, I totally understand what you're doing um, or, or what you mean. Um, for me, in particular, um, and which is why I'm really about um, um, embracing all, like getting rid of the labels of ourselves, is that I think people are scared of vulnerability in our creation, and I think. What I'm really interested in, especially from people who are in places of privilege, is what is actually your perspective on it, very particularly. Like, what is it like to be a person of privilege who is wrestling with these things, and who are the people in your lives that are influencing you to question these? How did you discover this? I mean, for me, uh, you know, there are times where I do encounter privilege, um, but I would like to understand what are the thoughts of other people uh, being earnest when they're having trouble connecting with me, or when they feel like they're need to be uh, walking on eggshells or whatever, right? And the second thing you can do, um, I actually am talking to someone who is considering doing, um, um, having different bits of the game written by different people, and taking those parts and letting them stand for themselves. Um, and so it's, 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 it's almost kind of like a journal, but in a, in a video game context of kind of like co collating a whole bunch of people into a thing. So another option is being like, well, I think it's interesting when I want to put these sorts of stories by these sorts of people together. So I'm going to curate other people saying their experience in this in this uh, thing. I think that's a really interesting idea. So you say that you're uh, just a single developer. Why not incorporate other people into your work? Like, that's actually a really interesting, if you're a, an individual developer and you're like, but I'm not sure that I want to put, like, 
too much weight on only my experiences. And I want to be like cognizant of all the other experiences available in the world. Yeah, why be an individual developer? Why not start incorporating, like adding people to your team and, and, and including them and valuing their experiences as equally important as your own? And so I think that's a really interesting, is this helping at all? <laughs> like instead of answering directly, I feel like we're giving you ideas. <laughs> Other stuff you could be doing with your, with your work in life, and I don't know if that's presumptuous. So. I I feel like if uh, if I had the scope of resources to bring on additional developers and the exponential overhead increases, <laughs> I don't um, think you even need to do developers necessarily. It's just you know I think there's some. It's a good thing to ask the conversation or to ask the question in the first place. But like I, I doubt. Um, the example Maddie's talking about involves other developers, but if you if you if you are a, a white gay guy and you want to tell the story of a transgendered Asian woman who grew up in Minnesota, um, I I don't think that you know you can do that without getting the help of someone who's actually lived that experience, and it may not be a developer relationship per se, but it's still you. you you're, otherwise, you're just writing it from the perspective of what you think that that actually is. And so you can't do that if you want to actually do the justice. Are they giving us the... Oh, we have five more minutes. I'd like to add to that, but actually, I have, I have been a paid consultant to give my perspective from, like, there's, like, a privileged writer who's working on something and wanted to trans perspectives on some of the trans characters, and I was a paid consultant for that. Mm -hmm. um, it was short term. It was just, like, it was a small amount of pay, but I would pay for it, and I gave an insight on stuff. And so you can do things like that. And you can, you know, but do pay. It's like signing up for college classes. And also, the other part you have to take with that is that you have to accept what they tell you, including the part that makes you uncomfortable. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Well, that's what you said about walking on eggshells, because I think a lot of people who don't, I mean, this is something that I struggled with for so long that uh, I didn't have ever face any, and I think you can relate to this too, I never faced any particular challenges so I didn't understand, oh it can't be that bad, or what did you do to make that happen? And it wasn't until, you know, probably my mid-twenties that I started to realize, oh, I've been an ass. <laughs> and, and yeah, you have to, just because something may not mesh with your life experience doesn't invalidate it. Oh, finding out that you don't literally know everything in the world ever is like the hardest experience. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I think we have to have one more question. I, so, uh, me? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I just pointed. Yeah, I'm, 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 bad. I'm trying to be democratic about it. Oh. I saw your hand go up first. I'm sorry, you can ask it after. If it's a quick question. <laughs> Did you want to? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you talked about calling up people. Uh, that was actually my first experience with realizing that other trans women didn't develop games at all. Uh, but so that reminded me that with my age key particularly, um, a lot of the way that, that those kinds of games, similar games about people's personal experiences, uh, biographical, biographical games, they're mentioned as like, uh, I don't know, God, I don't remember the name now, but it's, it, they, they mentioned it's basically like allowing that don't have those experiences to live those experiences. And there are like problems with trying to say like, okay, this is what it is like. Playing this single game is what it is like to be Yeah, well you mentioned right. that that all women, you know, here's you get asked in an interview and suddenly you're the expert on what it is to be one that you know female. Yeah, like so like what are the what do you think are like the positives and negatives of like having biographical games because they can definitely like people will make them stand on their own sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think we always have to resist tokenization. You're like, um, all, at all times, I try to name drop as many people I could possibly do. Uh, and unfortunately, because of just how many use runs, um, I'm very much tokenized for a lot of things. Like, you know, um, just over these past couple of months, I was shown to be like the sole creator of a whole bunch of stuff that I was not. Um, <laughs> that was really annoying. I mean, but um, well, the, thing, the good thing, though, um, the good thing I think about by, uh, autobiographical games, and at the same time, the DIY movement of games means that if there are just so many people to where, like, 
everyone making an autobiographical game is just a thing that you just don't want to think about anymore, then like we erase that problem. Like, you know, you erase a problem of like, oh, here is like the quintessential, you know, queer you know, twine game. You know, like that's gonna be impossible. You know, it already is impossible, right? Like if you just like I always say, like, just Google like queer twine or something and like it just explodes. You know, there's like, so many of them. So like it's I think we are handling that problem, which is why my answer to a lot of things is for people who don't consider themselves game creators to start creating, because the the best way to do it is to be to put in your little slot, even if it's just some you think it's just some small insignificant thing. It actually is just like you know the drop in the ocean. You know, it's just I think that's. I would add to you that you are the expert of exactly one thing, and that's you. Mm -hmm. You are the expert of you. And if you are making an autobiographical game, um, you do get to be the expert mm -hmm. of you. And um, if there is some way to convey to the player, as you said, um, you know, this isn't necessarily everybody's experience. This is my experience, mm -hmm. and I put it into a game. And so, I think we're end of sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess we uh, will stick around if anyone has any questions that they want to ask directly. Um, but thank you guys so much for coming out and...